Good evening and welcome to this important lecture by Professor Larry Davidson of the Yale University's Centre for Recovery and Community Health. <laughs> My name is Jerry Norton. I'm Chief Executive of Mind Australia. Mind is co-sponsor of this lecture tonight, along with the University of Melbourne. I wish to pay our respects to the elders past and present of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation who have nurtured and tended the lands on which we are for thousands of years. The University of Melbourne and Mind Australia have forged a strong working relationship over the past few years. And we are delighted that one of the outcomes of these collaborations is this public lecture this evening. Strong collaborations have been formed with the School of Population Health, the Department of Psychiatry and Asia Australia Mental Health. I wish to tonight acknowledge the leadership of Professor Terry Nolan, the Director of the School of Population Health, and Professor Ian Everill, who I'll introduce shortly, the head of the Department of Psychiatry, in these collaborations, and thank them for their leadership in this area. I would also like to acknowledge the work of Anthony Stratford and Margaret Grigg from Mind in the planning of tonight's events. I'm particularly pleased tonight that this lecture occurs on the historic commencement day of Disability Care Australia. Some of us have been in Geelong today at some of the official commencement ceremonies, and there is a palpable um, energy and engagement in relation to the Disability Care Australia program, which I find particularly exciting and exhilarating at this point in our history. Disability care brings with it the intent of recognising and respecting the lived experience of people with severe and enduring mental health. It is a transform transformative change in Australia for people with physical, sensory and psychiatric disabilities. In our view, it is the beginning of both a policy and a process that needs to evolve, grow, and be refined over the next five years in making the reality of those aspirations of Disability Care Australia real. It is now my pleasure to introduce Professor Ian Everill, the Cato Chair and Head of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Melbourne, to introduce Professor Do Thank, you. Thank you, Jerry. Um, it's an uh, absolute pleasure to be here, to welcome you all here to this free lecture this evening. And it's my pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Larry Davidson, who's the Professor of Psychiatry at the Yale Medical School. And uh, again, it's also a pleasure to have this opportunity to collaborate and co-badge with Mind Australia. Professor Davidson has um, been prolific in the area of focusing on the interface of recovery in psychiatric and substance abuse disorders and the people who are affected in their membership in society. He's published well over 200 publications and has contributed enormously to empowering individuals experiencing mental health problems. He obtained his bachelor's degree at Emory University in 1982 and his PhD at De Quen University in 1989. And uh, he's, as, as I said before, now occupying a chair of psychiatry at Yale Medical School. So uh, it's uh, my pleasure to ask Professor Larry Davidson to come and speak to us about the contribution of mental health reform by people who have experienced mental health challenges. Thank you. Thank you and good evening. It's a pleasure to be back in Melbourne. And I'm very happy to be here on the auspicious occasion of the inauguration of your new social disability insurance plan, which, uh, as I understand it, is a fairly significant reform in and of itself. And I am here to talk to you about a, a th what I think is a complementary reform that's been uh, in process in the United States for about the past 10 years, a little bit longer than that perhaps, and is also a uh, reform that's underway in many other countries as well, and I might mention that as we go along. So the question is how to reform mental health care in order to promote recovery. And there are some things that we know we can do, 
such as decreased stigma, discrimination, and other barriers to access to care, facilitate early identification and ensure timely access to early intervention. And as you know, that's a uh, very important contribution that this very university has made to the global mental health field and utilize practices that are evidence-based. So these are sort of common sense notions that I think most of us could agree would be important components of a reform that would make mental health care timely, accessible, and effective. But is that all? And the main point of my comments this evening to give you a sort of a brief preview of coming attractions is that while these are all things that we as professionals can do, policy makers, decision makers, administrators, chairs of psychiatry and practitioners, and maybe with the help of carers or family members, these are all things that we can do. This is not even half of the picture. And by far, the most work that needs to be done in reforming mental health care is not something that we can do directly but it's something that we can do indirectly by supporting those persons who experience mental health conditions firsthand because they have the bulk of the responsibility for reforming the field. And I will uh, explain that as I go, but that's sort of the brief uh, Cliff Notes version is there are many things that professionals and practitioners need to do, but there are many more things that persons in recovery need to do as well. So where we are in beginning this conversation is by acknowledging that only about a third of individuals with serious mental illnesses receive specialty mental health care. I believe that's as true in Australia as it is in the US. Even fewer of those people will get care in a timely fashion and, even and the efficacy of those interventions will be limited and modest at best. 80% of people will be rehospitalized within the first five years following a first episode. Cognitive remediation, which about 10 years ago seemed to be the best promise we had on the horizon, has led to only small to moderate effects, neuropsychological effects, which have yet to generalize to everyday life. Supported employment, which is what we often point at to as perhaps the most robust evidence-based practice in psychiatric rehabilitation, uh, at least in the US has only led to about an average of about $1,500 a year, so it's not nearly enough for people to live off of. Um, and while things like assertive community treatment, which I know Australia has been using for many years, um, while it reduces symptoms and perhaps may increase quality of life, is received by very few people <coughs> and has not led to self-sufficiency or independence. So if this were all that we knew, about the services that we can provide and the treatments that we have to offer, there would be cause for significant pessimism and concern. How can we talk about recovery-oriented care when the care that we have to offer doesn't seem to promote recovery in any effective or wide-scale basis? However, that's not all we know. What else do we know? We know that domains of functioning are only loosely linked. My mentor at uh, Yale for the past 25 years now has been John Strauss, who did some of the early research in the 1960s and 70s with the World Health Organization that showed that domains of functioning are only loosely linked and that there's a broad heterogeneity in outcome, even for schizophrenia, which has long been thought to be the most severe and refractory of the mental illnesses. 45 to 65 percent of people with psychosis will experience significant improvements over time when we follow them over time, and we can talk about that if you like. And the vast majority of persons who would have been institutionalized prior to 1954 are now living in the community. In the US, that's been 90%. 90% of the people who prior to 1954 would have lived out the majority of their adult lives in institutions are now living in the community. And many of them are experiencing significant improvements 10 to 15 years into the course of their illness and living, I dare say, at a level that while we might agree is substandard and needs significant improvement, is still well beyond what we might have anticipated in the 1950s. So we have an intriguing discrepancy. Few people, I would guess about 5% or less, benefit from the few effective interventions we have, and the effects of these treatments are only small to moderate. If you were wondering what I mean by that, um, antipsychotic medications, which are often considered to be the most potent uh, 
measures we have in our armamentarium are only effective for 70% of people who take them and are only effective in reducing positive symptoms, which are not the most disabling aspects of the illness. So we, while we may be proud of the progress we've made in psychopharmacology, we still have much, much further to go. So we don't have that much to offer people that's effective, and we haven't been very successful in getting it to many people. Yet, at the same time, over half of the people who experience partial to full recovery over time, and only about 15 to 25 percent will experience the deteriorating condition that Kreplin told us was intrinsic to the nature of the disorder. So how are we to understand this? Basically, what we have to offer is not that great, and yet people get better anyway. And I won't get into it tonight, but there's also cross-cultural literature that suggests that people get better qu more quickly and more fully in the developing world as opposed to the developed world and in, in communities in which the effective interventions that we have to offer are often non-existent or inaccessible. So this is a challenge I'm leveling for you, and I welcome you to, when we have time for pushback, I welcome you to challenge me on these provocative comments. But this is how I see the world. What service users have suggested to us, how we understand this discrepancy, and what we've learned from the recovery movement to date, is that we can't yet cure these illnesses but many people, and I would dare to suggest that if we look at it longitudinally over time, most people figure out how to live a decent life with the illness. With effective services and supports, many can lead even better lives than they would on their own. But while we have yet figured out how to cure the illness, many people have figured out how to live with it anyway. And that suggests that there are a number of challenges for us. We need to rethink the relationship of care to recovery. We need to rethink the role of the practitioner. We need to shift the focus from what we can't change to what we can change. And to do all of these things, to think about the relationship differently, to rethink, to think about the role of the practitioner differently, and to shift the focus from what we can't change, which is that this person has a mental illness, to what we can change, which is how this person deals with having a mental illness. We need to learn from people in recovery themselves. These are not things we can figure out on our own, in our offices, or in our labs. This is something that service users, persons with mental illnesses, need to teach us. Now, I've been giving talks like this one now for about 20 years, and I've often heard this, these two responses from the very same person, which is somewhat confusing. Um, but the first thing I often hear is that recovery is not possible for my patients. Talking about recovery with them just builds up false hopes and is cruel. So the data I'm giving you are not trustworthy. The people who I see in my practice, the people who you see in your practice, don't recover. They don't live well with their illnesses. What I'm saying makes no sense and is cruel. And if you doubt the veracity or the, mag the uh, seriousness of this concern, I was almost denied tenure at Yale based on this concern of some of my senior colleagues, that I was an irresponsible, unethical um, polemicist who didn't understand just how damaging and devastating these illnesses really are. At the same time that someone will say that, they will then turn around and say, well, there's nothing really new about recovery. We've been doing it all along. And like I said, this often comes from the same person, so it's somewhat confusing. But everything I'm saying about recovery-oriented practice is, is old news. There's nothing new in any of this, and we've done this for as long as we've had psychiatry, so what's this all about? And instead of getting into a debate about these two responses, I want to get concrete and talk about how recovery-oriented care is different and what we're learning from persons in recovery as we listen to them in our research and in our practice. And to do that, I want to give kudos to this gentleman. His name is Tom Kirk, and he was the commissioner of the state of Connecticut's mental health system from 1999 to 2009, and was my main co-conspirator in trying to figure out what a recovery-oriented system would look like. And Tom uh, liked to get out of his office and go and visit programs and people and talk to service users and family members and hear from their perspective how things were going and what could be made better. And he would tell this one story that I will tell you about a 27-year-old man with schizophrenia and alcohol dependence 
who we will call Steve. Steve was living in a group home, residential, supported a residential program, and had recently been discharged from the state hospital where he had spent about 10 years. And Tom was visiting this program and had the opportunity to sit down with Steve over coffee in the living room, and they talked for about 10 minutes and had a chat. And then at the end of his visit, as he usually did, Tom sat down with the staff for a debriefing and said, so I've seen your place, I've talked to your clients, you know, tell me what's going on here, tell me about your program. And they would tell him about the program and he would listen. And at the end of their description of how things were going and the laundry list of needs they had that he should meet by giving them more money and all the other things that are involved in these visits, he would say, well, tell me about Steve. I had a chance to meet Steve. How's Steve doing? And the staff said, oh, Steve, he's great. He's terrific. He's, he settled in really well when he came out of the state hospital. He didn't give us any difficulties at all, didn't complain about anything, wasn't resistant. He would get up. He would go to his groups. He would take his medication as prescribed. He never gave us a lick of trouble. He's really become a model patient in this program. And Tom said, that's fabulous. That really is a testament to you. It's a testament to Steve. I'm really glad to hear things are going so well. Next, Yes, things are going really well. And then he said, so what's next? And they said, well, what do you mean, what's next? I said, well, what's next for Steve? He's doing well, I hear that, I'm really glad. But, you know, what's next? And they didn't understand the question. He's taking his medication, he's going to his groups, he's fit in really well in the group home. Steve's doing really great. I said, that's great, but Steve's 27. Is this what Steve's going to be doing for the rest of his life? Going to groups, taking his medication, and being a model patient? Is that all there is for Steve in his life? Is being a model patient? Which leads to this cartoon. This is a very impressive resume, young man. I think you're going to make a fine patient. <laughs> the staff didn't really understand the point, so Tom pushed it a little further and said, well, what do you think Steve might like to do? Does Steve have any goals? We, we introduced person-centered care planning into the Connecticut system about 10 years ago. Staff are familiar with this notion of goals, so he hit on a buzzword, what are his goals? Well, Steve doesn't really have goals, really. I mean, he hasn't really articulated any goals. You know, he'd been in the hospital for 10 years. I think Steve's really happy just to be out of the hospital, and, you know, in a nice place like this where people care about him and the food's pretty good. He yes. said, well, that's interesting because I, you know, just had coffee with Steve for a few minutes, and he told me he really would like to be a mechanic. He's loved cars his whole life, and he really liked to be working in an auto repair shop. Did you know that about Steve? Well, yeah, maybe he mentioned that before, but Steve's schizophrenic. Yes, Steve has schizophrenia. Well, he's schizophrenic. He couldn't possibly be an auto mechanic. Oh, really? Well, I don't know whether Steve can be an auto mechanic or not, but I know there's probably lots of ways that Steve could be living out his dream and, of loving cars and hanging out with repairmen and maybe going to car races and maybe subscribing to a car magazine, you know, maybe watching NASCAR races on TV. You ever sit down with Steve and watch NASCAR races? So on and on the conversation went. So the underlying point of this, which I don't think will surprise you, is that people with mental illnesses want the same things out of life as other people do. They're not their diagnoses. They're not subsumed entirely by the illness. The person continues to exist alongside of the illness. And while mental health care has tried to address the illness and its symptoms, it has not been very successful or paid much attention to addressing the person and his or her everyday life and how to enhance and improve that everyday life while the illness continues to exist alongside of it. So the challenge for us in terms of mental health reform is how to stop accepting long-term disability and begin to promote long-term functioning and meaningful, which in Western democracies like ours and yours, Southern democracies, it means self-determined life. How to promote long-term functioning and a meaningful self-determined life in the community. What kind of revolution would it take for, to bring about a mental health system that was oriented in this fashion? The word revolution is in quotes because I will show you in a minute that that's a term that was used in policy documents in the United States in 2005. How to assure that people with serious mental illnesses that they have retained the right to be a person 
and to be a full citizen of their community even while they may be disabled? So how to support them in doing so even when the illness does not go away? Uh, in a 2005 mental health action plan published by the United States government, we read that what we need is a revolution in mental health care. I don't actually have the quote here, but believe me, it said we need a revolution in mental health care. So in trying to understand what, how a revolution is different from just a reform, I happened on this passage from John McKnight, who's a sociologist in Chicago, who had spent his life working with people with disabilities. And he says, revolutions begin when people who are defined as problems achieve the power to redefine the problem. And to me, that's sort of the best way of describing what the reform in mental health care that we're talking about is going to entail. Mental health systems, I've, I've been working with mental health systems for about 20 years, and mental health systems have traditionally viewed service users as their problem. The problem we have is people who use services who are difficult to engage or they're, they're recidivists, they're frequent flyers. We have all kinds of language for the people that we are supposed to be serving, which conveys the message that they are the problem and they are the people we're supposed to fix. We're supposed to fix these people so they're not problems anymore. What uh, Professor McKnight is suggesting is that the revolution will start when those people, the people who we have viewed traditionally as the problems, redefine what the problem is in their own terms. And this is the role that service users need to play in the revolution or the reform process. People who are traditionally seen as burdens on a system and a state or a province or a whatever the sector might be, come to be seen as that system's greatest assets. They become the reform leaders. Oops. Another way to say this, in the US, I imagine it's similar in, in Victoria, we talk about needing to create a consumer-driven system, consumer and family-centered care, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I don't know of any way to create a consumer-driven system without consumers being the ones driving the system. And we've talked about putting people in the driver's seat. And their response to us has been, but I'm not even in the damn car. How do you expect me to take the wheel when I'm not even in the car? So as a step toward helping people get into the driver's seat, we at least need to bring them into the car, and we need to develop partnerships, collaborative relationships, in which we value their life experience and their expertise by experience, and they value our professional knowledge and accumulated wisdom, and we have a partnership. We cannot transform the system by ourselves any more than we can cure mental illness by ourselves. So why do I think people in recovery can play this role? They are a primary source for identifying the strengths of a given system and for charting a course forward. If you want to know what's working well in your system, just ask the people who use it and they'll tell you. This is working well, this is not so well. This is where you need to focus to make improvements. They have the most at stake, they have the most to gain and the most to lose in the process of reform. They can be the most effective antidote to stigma and discrimination. I know uh, for a long time Australia has been part of a WHO initiative to address stigma, the stigma that surrounds mental health. The research has been pretty consistent in showing that public education campaigns are very limited in their effectiveness and the most effective way to address stigma is to have people in recovery in the room being positive role models and showing that recovery is possible. And they have a strong desire to give back and have a lot to offer in terms of energy, ideas, and support for change. How could our patients know what needs to change? How could the people that we serve, who, let's acknowledge, have a mental illness, how could they know what's best for themselves and for the system? Well, we have expertise when it comes to diagnosing and treating illnesses or assessing and remediating deficits. That's our expertise. But when it comes, when we're shifting the focus to living a meaningful life in the community, along with an illness, each person has the right to determine what kind of life he or she wants to lead and the expertise to know what they need in order to do so. So who would know better than Steve 
that he happened to love cars. And he wanted some time of his daily life spent involved with cars, even if it meant hanging out at a local repair shop and chatting with the mechanics. <clears throat> Who else would know that better than Steve? Or perhaps his mother might know that too. When little is expected, little is delivered. When much is expected, people have the tendency to rise to the occasion. And when asked, and if they believe you will listen, people have tremendous amounts to offer to this process. Now, this is a picture of a psychiatric hospital, a mental asylum in Italy in 1954, or six, 61, I think it was, 61. And if this is your image of what a person with schizophrenia looks like, then, you, then obviously you have much reason to be skeptical that this person, these people, could contribute to systemic reform efforts. But we now know, 50 years later, that this is not what mental illness looks like for the most part. Since people came out of hospitals, they no longer look like this. These same people today would be living in supported apartments and perhaps working part-time jobs or going back to school. It wasn't the illness that put them in this condition. It was a combination of the illness and the institution. So if we still think of people with mental illnesses as limited and disabled in these ways, then we're going to be very skeptical about how service users can participate as partners in system reform. <clears throat> but that's not what people look like anymore. This is a picture, you can't really see it very well, but that's a picture of my staff, faculty and staff back at Yale. That's Pat Deegan actually in the front row. She was visiting us for the day. Pat Deegan, if you don't know, is a very eloquent spokesperson for the service user movement who has schizophrenia and happens to be a clinical psychologist and is probably the most eloquent person I know when it comes to talking about these issues. So she was visiting us for the day. But over half of those people who are faculty and staff at Yale University have mental illnesses. These same people would have been those people 50 years ago. But now they're these people working at a major university doing what I'd like to believe is cutting edge research. <clears throat> so the new vision is that people in recovery will be actively and meaningful involved throughout all aspects of service provision, including comprising a significant proportion of boards of directors, advisory boards, steering committees, and work groups. They are routinely invited to share their stories with other service recipients and to provide training to staff. They have the maximum opportunity for informed choice and decision-making in their own care. And we encourage them to exercise their responsibility and to make meaningful contributions to their own recovery and to the community as a whole. Just uh, one example of this. I was uh, at a hospital in Connecticut many years ago talking about this notion that service users could get involved in advisory boards and work groups and things like this. And they were having a very difficult time. This was an acute inpatient unit, and they were having a very difficult time understanding how persons who required acute inpatient care could participate in such work groups, for example. But we had some service users in the room at the time who were um, at that hospital. And one of them said, uh, so I asked them what work groups they had at this hospital, and they mentioned that they had performance improvement committees, which in the US, everybody has to have performance improvement committees. It's part of your accreditation. And I asked them what the performance improvement committee was working on at the time, and they said medication errors. It's a big problem for hospitals. It's something that the accrediting body really looks at very seriously. Everybody has to be working to reduce medication errors. And there was a service user in the room who said, well, I'd like to be on that committee. Everybody looked at her. She said, well, I think I could help you reduce medication errors. And they said, well, what, what, what ideas would you have about that? And she said, well, do you ask people if these are the medications they're supposed to be taking? Because <laughs> I know if you came up to me and you, and you showed me you know, the medications you were going to give me, and you said, are these the medications you're supposed to be taking? And I looked at it, and I said, well, I don't get an orange one. Why are you giving me an orange one? I always get blue and white ones. Maybe that would reduce your medication errors if you asked the patients who you were giving them to if these looked right to them. It's just a small example. So we've taken this to, uh, to lots of lengths. We've taken this to measures of satisfaction with services and supports. 
And not only have we used satisfaction surveys developed by service users, but we have service users and carers administering the satisfaction surveys so that we get honest appraisals. Uh, we have We have developed a transformation inventory, which has these four components to it. I'm not going to go through each of this. The survey looks like this. Um, but it asks significantly about the ways in which service users are engaged in designing care and delivering care and in evaluating and monitoring care. And satisfaction surveys are just one example. But another example is uh, in the state of Connecticut, we have a quality improvement collaborative made up of service users and family members. And this was initially a challenge to see how we could educate service users and family members around this notion, the whole notion of quality and quality improvement. And first there was much skepticism that nobody would show up to the invitation. And I get this, I get asked this question a lot in my travels. It's, well, how do you get service users involved? And my answer has always been, you invite them. But even in my home state of Connecticut, where we've been doing this work for a long time, we started talking about this quality improvement collaborative, and the question came up again, well, how are you going to get service users and family members to come? And I said, you invite them. And sure enough, 450 people showed up for the first evening in which we discussed the notion of quality. And it was my job to explain to this group of 450 service users and family members, what, is, what do we mean by quality? And I ended up talking about my iPhone. Because everybody now has phones. Everybody, even people who are impoverished, live below the poverty line, somehow still have cell phones. So I held up my iPhone and I said, you know, we all have these now. How do you know if you have a good one or not? What makes for a good cell phone? And they started shouting out things that they wanted in their cell phones. Well, you don't want to lose your coverage. You don't want to drop phone calls. You want this, you want that. They have all these features of what they're looking for in an ideal cell phone. So then we asked them, can you think the same way about your mental health care? What makes for good mental health care as opposed to not such good mental health care? And that then was about a six to nine month process of developing a quality assessment tool that was consumer and family driven that was then administered by consumers and or service users, sorry, service users and family members to about 1,200 of their peers in the state, which then gave us a report card. These are the areas in which we got Bs. We can get As in anything, but we can. These are the areas in which we got Bs. These are the areas in which we got Cs, and these are the areas in which we're really failing. And interestingly enough, one of the areas in which we were really failing was asking people for their feedback about the services they received which could be in part because we were asking them for that feedback by doing the survey and it occurred to them, gee, nobody ever asked me this before. How come nobody's ever asked me what I thought of the services I was receiving before? <clears throat> so this has become a, a cornerstone, I would say, of the transformation efforts. And whenever I'm asked to work with other systems, the first thing I bring up is how have service users been involved so far? And how might you increase the participation of service users in the future. And still, and the reason I include this is because I am amazed at the degree to which people in charge of administering large systems still, deep down, have this image of the people they serve. They really don't believe that people with mental illnesses can be competent, thoughtful, insightful, articulate partners in the reform process. But I would dare say that while I may have over 200 publications, I've learned the most in my work from people who use services. They're the ones who've taught me the most about what it means to live with a mental illness and what kind of services can be provided to support them in their efforts to live with a mental illness. Because that, in the end, recovery is not something I can do for you. Recovery is something that you have to do with my support. So I think I'll just stop there and see what comments or questions people have. Thank you. I um, probably just first want to say that I agree with you that uh, probably modern Western civilization is probably bad for mental health. But uh, in general, with the rest of the population, what about um, 
things like addressing, uh, say, teaching, say, cognitive behavioural therapy in schools or negotiation skills, um, sort of, it, not only people with uh, mental illnesses, but everyone else as well, because um, surely that would benefit everyone if um, more people were aware of uh, potential problems they might have and uh, aware of others as well. That's a great question. We've certainly seen a huge investment in and increase in that kind of educational curricula since the shootings at Columbine High School, which was about 15 or so years ago in the US. It was the first mass school shooting by other students. So my uh, daughters, I have three wonderful daughters, and they've gone through public elementary schools, and they've learned a lot about psychological health and health promotion and bullying and how to not bully and what to do if you're bullied and all that kind of stuff. They've learned a lot about what we might call health promotion. And I think that's great, and I think the more of that we do, the better. But it comes back to what you think of the nature of mental illnesses. And if you think of mental illnesses as illnesses, and we are, after all, in the brain center of the University of Melbourne, as I understand it, and I happen to agree that these are illnesses, then no amount of health promotion or coping skills and all that stuff is going to necessarily prevent the onset of a major mental illness. What we haven't done, although you've done it in Melbourne, and I think you're leading the world along with the TIPS folks in, in Norway, what we haven't done in the U.S. yet is educate teens and families about the early warning signs of mental illness. That we need to do a lot more of. And I am a firm believer in early intervention. I think it's the promise of the future. And I also think that what's probably going to change our mental health systems as much or more as today's service users are tomorrow's service users. Because the young people coming through the first, the early intervention programs or in the absence of early intervention programs in the US, they're the ones who are saying, I don't want what you have to offer. So if you want to help me, you need to help me in a way that I find respectful and responsive, not the way you want me to be helped. So I think that's a tremendous um, promise for the future is that they will change our system in ways that we couldn't even imagine. Yes? About how to bring people who work in uh, acute mental health services into contact with people with long-term recovery. At the moment, my understanding is that the PDRS sector has some kind of quota, at least some of the services do, to have consumer mentor workers. So anybody working on those services is automatically exposed in an ordinary working environment to people in recovery. We don't have that in acute mental health services at this stage. I'm, I'm not aware of it anyway. And it seems that where people are constantly working at the point end, where people are the most unwell, that their vision of what recovery is possible is limited merely by their experience. And I, I think that needs to change. I think that we need to have peer workers all the way through the mental health sector, not only providing the hope and the role modelling um, for uh, service users and their families, but actually challenging the workers every single day that they sign on um, about any kind of residual um, yeah, stigma that they still carry in their hearts for, for this, you know, the slide you have up at the moment. I just really wish that that could happen. Well, that has happened in some places. I'm actually surprised it hasn't happened as much here, although, well, anyway. We have uh, peer workers in the emergency room. We have peer workers on acute care inpatient units. We have peer workers in pretty much any component of the mental health system you can mention. The difficulty of putting peer workers on inpatient units, for example, is you don't want them to bear the entire burden for transforming the culture of the unit. And I would be loath to put peer workers on an inpatient unit unless that unit had made a fairly significant investment in changing its culture, assuming it's a traditional inpatient unit. Um, and that would have to go along with being trauma-informed and using behavioral de-escalation techniques and doing all, having a quiet room or a, it, having all those things that, that really progressive inpatient units now have. I wouldn't want to stick a peer worker on a traditional inpatient unit. But, if, but if, if having peer workers on a unit is part of an overall transformation process, I think that can be very helpful and very powerful. But we have to do a lot of work to create 
settings in which peer workers are supported in what they do, rather than viewed as somehow as being the enemy. I, I'm going to leave this up just for sake of conversation, but it's not, we're not just talking about the 1960s. In Connecticut, as recently as 2000, 2001, there was, well, a law was passed in 1999, the Dodd-Lieberman Act, which was from Connecticut. Two senators from Connecticut passed this law, limiting the use of restraint and seclusion to emergency measures only. I don't know where that stands now in, in Australia, but this was a huge shift in the U.S. You could no longer use restraint and seclusion for ma unit management f as part of a care plan for all the other reasons we used to use them. They could only be used in emergencies and only for as long as the emergency lasted. And exit criteria had to be stipulated at the initial use of these measures. So this was a big change. And I was working with the state at the time and the medical director said there's no way we can do this and have safe units. It's impossible. These are stupid politicians. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't understand mental illness. There's no way we can do this. And actually, that was, I came to Melbourne for my first time shortly before that, actually, and was visiting an acute care unit in Melbourne. I don't remember the hospital. But I asked the nurse manager who was giving me the tour, I said, so tell me about your use of restraint and seclusion. And she looked at me and she said, Dr. Davidson, we don't use restraints here, which, of course, is exactly what I wanted to hear. And I said, well, how is that possible? Because in our, you know, back in the U.S., we're changing policies. And, we're, and she said, well, people know how to behave here. <laughs> so I took that back to my medical director back in Connecticut, and he didn't think that was very helpful. <laughs> um, but despite his skepticism, he oversaw a process in which we trained all the staff in de-escalation techniques, and we educated all the staff about the change in policies. And we brought peer workers into the hospital. And within one year, we reduced restraint and seclusion use by 90%. And this is a state hospital. This was not a private cream skimming hospital. This was the state hospital for the state of Connecticut. Now, everybody thought that was wonderful. He was very proud of the progress. Everybody thought it was wonderful. But I kept thinking, but that means that just a year ago, Nine times as many people were in restraints and seclusion that needed to be. You got to think about the opposite too. So we're, we're restraining and secluding 90% fewer people now, or 90% fewer episodes of use. That means that just a year ago, before we did all this training, we were using restraint and seclusion nine times more than we needed to be. Because it's not the patients weren't any different. Same patients, same hospital. What was different was how the staff behaved. And the biggest change the staff made in reducing use of restraint and seclusion was by not provoking patients into arguments. So it's not just that we think people were like this. Just 12 years ago, we still thought that people with serious mental illnesses inevitably would need restraint and seclusion. And we now know that that's not the case. Um, good evening, Dr. Davison. This is a, uh, a first year uh, student from ANU. Uh, my question is, what is the uh, validity to recognize uh, negative symptoms uh, as uh, sequential uh, uh, manifestation of intense globalization and encountering of uh, race, ethnicity, uh, gender, class, and nationality, rather than uh, recognize them to be uh, a um, illness. And also recognize what is the validity to recognize positive symptoms to be a mode of uh, perhaps uh, rationalize or perceiving uh, and uh, interacting with, with the, the uh, social and cultural milieu. Wow. <laughs> great question. I hope you keep asking questions like that. That's a great question. Um, I, I've been having this ongoing debate about negative symptoms for a very long time, and I don't have a definitive answer. 
but I've certainly been impressed um, about the degree to which negative symptoms abate when people have something of interest that interests them. And this is not something that I alone have acknowledged. It's something that Pinnell actually wrote about in the seven, eight, 18th century, late 18th century, that, you, that people who may look somewhat like this or people who maybe in less extreme cases, people who appear to be suffering from prominent negative symptoms when brought into new environments or offered opportunities to do things they enjoy all of a sudden seem to have less negative symptoms. So I certainly think all the issues that you mentioned are very, are contributory. Whether or not that explains the entire thing, I don't know, but they certainly are a part of it and a pretty significant part of it. Positive symptoms, that's another very interesting question. There's been a lot of work done, which I think has made its way here from New Zealand, if I'm not mistaken, around voice hearing. It started in the Netherlands, but now it's really become a global movement. And I know people in New Zealand who are very involved in it. I don't know if that's true in Victoria. But, you know, most people who hear voices are not diagnosed as having a mental illness. So voice hearing is something that is quite prevalent among a lot of people, not, not all of whom or not even the majority of whom end up being diagnosed with schizophrenia. So there's a lot of questions now about where voice, voice hearing comes from and how to understand it as it perhaps as a symptom of a mental illness or perhaps not because it doesn't always seem to be associated with with disability. There's a voice hearing network, which is now a global network of people who hear voices who don't have any psychiatric psychopathology or disability related to it. And I was having a uh, dinner with one of these gentlemen in uh, Switzerland, I think about a year or so ago. He's, he's British, but we were at a conference together in Switzerland. And he's a voice hearer and part of this network. And, and we were thinking, he was also a philosophy major and I was a philosophy major. So we were pondering the epistemology of voice hearing. You know. And he said, well, you know, it, it really doesn't have to be seen as a deficit or as a problem at all. You know, it's, it's, it, I actually view you as voice deprived. <laughs> and I thought, voice deprived? He said, yeah, you know. You have a dog, don't you? I have two dogs. I love dogs. He said, yeah, I have two dogs. I love my dog. He said, well, you know, they can smell things you can't smell. Does that make them smell sifters, uh, smell whatever, odor smellers? Or, you know, and I thought about that, and, and uh, about a week or so later, I was back at home, and it was uh, springtime, and our windows were open. And my dog, I have a dog, my wife has a dog. They're our dogs, but I have my dog. My dog sleeps right next to me. And my dog, who typically goes to bed around 9.30 and sleeps through the night, got up around 11 and was barking and barking and barking. I was going to wake up the children. I was going to wake up the neighbors. And I, was so, and I kept saying, what are you barking at? What are you barking at? It was, I couldn't see anything, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. So I thought maybe he needed to go outside. So I went down with him, and the minute I opened the door, I smelled a skunk. He knew the skunk was there long before I did. Now, that's not considered pathology. And David Crepe smith was guiding on saying, that's just like that. I can hear things you can't hear. So how does that make me sick? So it's a really good question, and I encourage you to keep asking those questions. The more I learn about mental illness, the less I think I know. So I would be reluctant to answer you in any kind of definitive way. But it's really good to ask those kind of questions. Professor, uh, I, I really appreciated the uh, general drive of your talk and um, I hope a lot of what you're talking about does uh, reform the system in, in these ways. Uh, I, I just wanted to say that I disagree. I, I'm not qualified to present a, an, a, a scientific uh, explanation, but I do disagree in the, um, uh, the, the point of illness, uh, mental illness necessarily being a biological illness. Biology isn't my strong point, but I, I like uh, the idea of there being meaning in certain experiences as you're talking about. Uh, voices, for example, some people, not me personally, but some people might consider them uh, angels or demons, they might have a range of different explanations for them. Um, 
but for me personally, the idea of um, uh, ego disturbances and, and the explanations to do with, with exaggerated thinking and uh, narcissism that go together with schizophrenia uh, make more sense and uh, offer a pathway to uh, a recovery that would be more meaningful than uh, just continuing to take the pills for the rest of your life. And uh, I, I don't want to say too much more, but just that um, at, at certain times, goals and this idea of mental health challenges uh, being a goal-directed activity towards recovery can become part of the um, uh, disordered thinking that people would like to separate <coughs> from the, um, uh, the the person, I suppose, and it's difficult to recover those parts at times when uh, you you want to find meaning in things that are not generally accepted as uh, normal behavioural um, exhibitions or whatnot. I just wonder what you think Thanks. about about the, the <coughs> objections to mental illness being described as an illness rather than perhaps a condition or an exaggeration of normal behaviour. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for the comment, and feel free to disagree with me. That's, that always makes it more interesting. I'm not, <coughs> I'm not insecure in my beliefs, so I welcome people to challenge and push back and question it. And I, again, I don't have a definitive answer to this. As a matter of fact, John Strauss, who I mentioned, has been my mentor for 25 years now. We have breakfast every Friday and have for 20 plus years when we're both in town. And I can guarantee you nine out of 10 of those breakfasts is spent debating the exact question you just raised. And I think there's an illness component and he thinks there isn't. And we go about this in lots of different ways. From my own perspective, I think trauma has a significant role to play, and I think these boundaries between normal and abnormal are very problematic and, and destructive, so I'm not interested in sort of what's normal and what's not normal. Um, I think trauma plays a big role, but I also think that, from just from my own personal experience, that there is some neurobiological component, and I can, I'll just tell you, but this is not what tonight's talk is about, but I'll just tell you. I had an undiagnosed mental illness for 17 years, and I was was then, I've been on medication now for about 15 years, so that was however long ago it was. But I was already a you know, doctor and a, a PhD, and I was already in mental health doing research and all this, and it, it occurred to me about 17 years after the onset of my own mental illness, when my wife said, I think there's something very wrong and you need to go see somebody. Um, and I was watching, I was up at the light because I couldn't sleep, which was part of the problem I was having, and I was watching TV at like 3 in the morning, and there was a C-SPAN show from the Carter Center in Atlanta, Georgia, which is where I grew up, and the Carters are big heroes of mine. And Alma Powell, the wife of Colin Powell, former Secretary of State, was talking about her own lifelong depression and how she didn't know until she was in her 40s and got treatment that you could actually wake up and have energy in the morning. This was new to her. She'd already been the mother of three kids and she'd had a full-time job and blah, blah, blah. So she was a high-functioning person. And the combination of seeing her, watching her, listening to her say that, and my wife sort of pushing me, got me into treatment. And I've been taking medication now for 15 years and I have tried to go off it twice, first on my own, which I should have known better. Second time I tried to go off it with the help of my psychiatrist, who I think is one of the best psychiatrists in the world. Um, but I'm still on it because I, it just didn't work for me. So uh, for me, whether what caused this, I don't know. I don't know what caused it, but I've seen that medication can be tremendously helpful to people and I wouldn't want them not to have the benefit of that out of some ideological stance that it can't possibly have a neurobiological component. I think it's complicated. I think it has all kinds of components, social, cultural, political, economic, but also biological components. So I have sort of a holistic view that these are people who are sick and deserve our compassion and our care. And yes, a lot of it has to do with their life circumstances and experiences up to this point, but a lot of it also is out of their control. And if we can help them to identify those parts they can't control and work on the parts they can, then they have a better, much better chance of having a good life, whether it's normal or not, I don't care, but a good life. 
What I like about what you said, which I would want to reinforce, is that people's experiences make sense to them. They may not make sense to us because we don't know them well enough or we haven't asked them the right questions or we haven't listened. But I've yet to meet a person with, with a psychotic disorder who didn't try their best to make sense of their own experiences. And it's much better to enter into a respectful dialogue to understand where they're coming from and where you're coming from so that you can come to some mutual understanding, even if you don't see it the same way, than just to label it as pathological and dismiss it. That, I think, has done a tremendous amount of damage to people. Yeah. Um, yeah, one of the um, strongest characteristics of the recovery movement, the way that you presented it, was this idea of um, getting on with a meaningful life in, in, while living with an illness disorder, group of symptoms, whatever it is, that you, how you describe it. And you mentioned briefly that one of the things that professionals can do was at the bottom of one of your dot point lists of the of ACT, the Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, which is a very popular... Oh, no, that was ACT as an assertive community treatment. So. Oh, oh, right, okay. But well, I'll bring up ACT that. anyway, because it really does link into just a couple of things you said yeah. last as well, the idea of, of living a valued life, you know, looking at your goals, what do I want to do, um, while, while these symptoms are, are going on for me. And um, so it's been quite a strong a lot of uptake of training and trying to implement ACT in the mental health sector in Australia. And I'm just wondering how you see, see that happening um, in the United States and also um, whether it's being, that approach is being embraced by consumer um, organisations and, and groups. I was, I was actually introduced to that kind of act by a service user. Ed Knight, who's a national leader of the service user movement in the U.S., sent out an email to our listserv talking about his, his uh, getting to know a, a set, uh, what is it, acceptance and commitment therapy, so was, and how excited he was. So I've, I've boned up on it some, and I, to what I can tell, it's very consistent with most of the recovery principles that I espouse. My one concern about acceptance and commitment therapy is a similar concern that I have to mindfulness, which we've now discovered after 4,000 years, might benefit people. It's, th these are things that could very well benefit people. But as long as they're framed in, I'm the expert, you're the client, and I'm going to teach you about these things, I worry about the continued power dynamic. So mindfulness, we've been doing for thousands of years. All of a sudden, it's an evidence-based practice that a licensed clinical psychologist needs to administer. That bothers me. I know Graham's very excited about it. It's a good thing. Mindfulness is a good thing. ACT may be a very good thing. But it's how it's framed and how it's delivered that I would be concerned about. Yes? Hi, I just wanted to say um, I really agree with a lot of things you said. It was really good to hear about the reform in the system and the style of consulting with consumers a lot more. I guess I had two questions, though. Um, in my knowledge, there's not any real studies of, like, for many patients or clients living medication-free on their own. It's not sort of a focus. Um, and also I sort of wanted to hear your opinion on consumer education and like how living with their mental illness may actually inform and that how perhaps medicating can sort of mask symptoms rather than being able to inform them with their experience. Um, and some of those people may want to avoid medicating some symptoms because it may, like uh, medicate symptoms, they may you know, influence their artistic creativity or other aspects that they may actually want to promote. Thank Great you. questions. There's one study done by Martin Harrow in Chicago now probably 10 years ago that suggested that people who did not get medication early in the course of their illness did better than people who did. It's the only study I know of, of its kind, but people have really gone to, gone to market with that one study and said that plus all the exposés about the influence of the pharmaceutical industry on psychiatry has really given a lot of people pause about is medication necessarily a first-line treatment for these conditions? And um, you in Melbourne probably know better than I do about this because you're doing the early intervention work, pioneering the early intervention work. But my latest understanding from Pat McGorry 
um, is that what seems most effective in working with people early in the development of a psychotic disorder are the psychosocial interventions more so than the treat the medical more so than the somatic treatments, the medications. I was involved in one prodromal study at Yale with Tom McGlashan in which the only treatment was medication. It was funded by Eli Lilly, and it didn't work. Um, not only could we not predict who was going to convert, but people just didn't respond. So I think we need a more robust approach than just medication for sure. Whether or not medication is needed, I would, I would leave to my colleagues who are much better, more knowledgeable about that than I am. What I can say is the open dialogue approach that was developed by Secula in Finland has reserved medications for a last resort rather than a first line, and the outcomes they're showing are pretty impressive. I haven't seen it yet firsthand, so I can't say too much more about it, but you can certainly Google it and find out. There are lots of studies published about it. It's called Open Dialogue, and they bring the family together with the practitioners and the person, and they try to find ways of helping the person deal with their experiences without using medication. And yes, people are very loath to use medication if it blunts their senses or their thoughts, and if it, if it covers over things that... If you, go, if you go along the voice hearers network, for example, Voices are trying to tell you something. So if all you do is try to get rid of them using medication, they get louder and more persistent, and they don't like you trying to get rid of them, so they get caustic and harsh and critical. I was wondering if we could have one last question, just because of the, uh, the time is getting Sorry, away. Uh, I was, there's a lot of uh, initiatives around understanding more of the physiology of the brain. I think Barack Obama announced a big initiative. $100 million. Dollars. Yeah. yeah. I'm just wondering, what do you think might come out of that understanding, in out of that work in terms of an understanding of, of uh, mental illness and, uh, and your work in, re in recovery? Well, the biggest change which has led to this new investment is in brain science, as they call it, is, the, is neuroplasticity. When, again, when I was new to the field, I was told that people with schizophrenia had brain atrophy and that once the brain started to atrophy, there was nothing that could be done to stop it. And once the brain was damaged, it was damaged forever. Now, lo and behold, we have a whole new science of neuroplasticity and regeneration. And we see psychotherapies regenerating, and we see the medications regenerating, and we see that the brain is much more resilient than we ever thought possible. So I'm tremendously hopeful that brain science will bring us all kinds of new understandings just where we are now is the director of the National Institute of Mental Health, Tom Insel, just about a month ago, came out with a statement that the NIMH, the U.S. National Institute of Mental Health, would no longer use the DSM-5 for diagnostic purposes because that diagnostic system lacked scientific validity. And we need a, a diagnostic system based on evidence, not on history. Now, you can debate that in lots of different ways, but those of us who've been clinicians for a long time know that the DSM has been very limited in its utility. And service users will tell you they typically have had five or six diagnoses by the time they become an advocate or you know, get into the course of their illness. Oh, oh yeah, I used to be bipolar, but then I got schizoaffective, now I have schizophrenia, but then they tell me maybe it's psychotic disorder, NOS, but I think I have borderline. <laughs> so I welcome this, this uh, bracketing of the whole DSM system, which goes back, as you know, to Kreplin and 200 years ago. Um, and I'm very interested to see what will come in its place. And I don't know what's going to come in its place. But I think the notion that we need to kind of start over is probably do. It's probably time that we start it over. I think that's probably it a great place for us to finish on our optimistic note of brain plasticity. I'd like you all to join me in thanking uh, Dr. Davidson for a fantastic and fascinating talk. Thank you very much.